Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome to your Ruby Live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the Director of Culinary Instruction here at Ruby, and I'm also one of your chef instructors in the courses. And uh, today it's my office hours, and I want to welcome each one of you to this uh, event today. Uh, this is your chance to ask me questions about food and cooking, and my opportunity to do my best to answer your questions. And, um, you know, as uh, we get started, I want to encourage you to um, participate, uh, certainly if you've got a question and a question or a comment, uh, it would be fine. And, uh, you know, if you want to uh, have more direct participation in today's event, you can enter your question in the dialogue box on the right hand side of the screen. And uh, that'll make its way to the queue, uh, the, the list of questions on the right side. And, um, you know, also, uh, you know, typically if, um, uh, you know, you want a question answered sooner than others, you can click on the heart shaped icon uh, that you'll see in the individual question boxes. Um, and then that will bump up that question in priority. You know, right now we have just a handful of questions, so that's probably not going to be a concern. Uh, but again, if you want to participate more directly, go ahead and type in your question. And uh, again, I'll ask you to, to keep that focused on the area of food and cooking uh, without straying out into uh, health and, and medicine and some of these uh, uh, more distant uh, topics, okay? Um, you know, as we start, I'm gonna first talk a bit about knife skills development. Uh, every week I get questions from students that come in via our Q&A forum uh, addressing various concerns and uh, challenges and um, just other wonderings, right, about using a knife and developing skills and knife safety and, and choosing a knife and uh, so on and so forth. And so I thought I would uh, take just a few minutes here and... Uh, talk about this broad topic and uh, put some of this into context for you as you start your course with Ruby, uh, whether it's the Forks Over Knives course or the Pro Plant course or uh, a different course. They all will start with knife skills and uh, you know this idea of efficient knife handling and also safe knife handling uh, which really forms the foundation of so much of what we do in the kitchen. Uh, you'll hear in one of our video lessons that uh, you know, in order to cook food, you have to first cut the food. You have to process it. You have to break it down in some fashion. And largely that's true, right? There are uh, certainly some exceptions we can come up with. But, you know, for the most part, when it comes to, to routine daily cooking, um, we do need to apply the knife to the food. And so, you know, as we uh, get started, I want to uh, say that knife skills development, uh, at least in, the, in our courses in the beginning here, uh, it's a very technical exercise, a very technical activity. And, you know, we hope that you will uh, practice and practice some more uh, before you submit your assignments and then also have patience with the process as you know, you, uh, your body assimilates to the new challenges, the pos body posture, the hand arm positioning, and the new uh, stresses and, and tensions that you feel uh, when going through the motions of, of cutting different foods, different uh, foods of different densities, hard foods and soft foods and large and small items uh, are gonna be coming your way. Um, you know, on the note of the technicality of knife cuts, um, you know, please know that when uh, we assess your assignments, right, the sample knife cuts that you submit, that the benchmark for grading is the classical knife cut examples that you'll be studying. And so, for example, a small dice uh, has a, a sort of a, a an arbitrarily standardized size in the restaurant industry at one quarter inch cubed. And so a cube then is going to have a, 
a, a quarter inch by quarter inch square right on each face and then each edge is going to be at 90 degrees and uh, that result is going to be a a nice even and consistent cube you know across all of your cuts and uh, because it is such a technical uh, exercise at this uh, at this point um uh, you know, we do ask you to, to practice a number of times and then also to, uh, to be patient with the process and to take, um, you know, the feedback that we provide you um, uh, and incorporate that, you know, into your future practice. Okay. Now, uh, you know, one thing that is paramount when it comes to knife skills development and knife handling is the safety portion of it. And uh, this is where, uh, you know, you're asked to get used to, if you're not already, uh, but to, to get used to uh, perhaps using a larger knife than uh, what you have grown up with. And, uh, you know, typically we're reaching for a, a chef's knife, what is broadly called a chef's knife. And it, it tend to be a little bit longer uh, in the blade length and a little bit taller as far as the blade size goes, and, and they, they taper toward the tip. And this is an all-purpose knife uh, that'll really allow you to do uh, the processing of small items and, and large items, uh, hard and soft. Um, there are some different uh, uh, types or styles of knives in this category, um, where uh, if we were to look at, at, the, at the top of the knife, this thickness uh, can vary. And generally speaking, um, a, a lot of European knives, you know, we see especially uh, German knives in the US market, but many of those are a little bit on the thicker and heavier side. And uh, what we generally refer to as, as Japanese knives, whether they're made in Japan or not, uh, they tend to be a little bit thinner in profile. And uh, so that can make a difference, too, in, in terms of uh, some of the fineness that you might be uh, um, striving for. Uh, but understand that part of that is also the practice, right, of getting used to controlling um, not just the knife as a, you know, a, as a, uh, a tool external to your body, uh, but also all the muscles in your hands and wrist and, and forearm and shoulders and, and all the way really from head to toe. Okay, uh, and so anyway, the chef's knife is going to be the place to start, and um, uh, there are many knives to choose from, as I'm sure you are aware. Uh, I would recommend that you uh, select a knife um, or add to your collection even a single chef's knife that is of, of pretty robust quality, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a a super expensive knife, uh, you know, knives, uh, you know, in a seven inch or eight inch chef's knife category uh, can range anywhere from say um, 50 or $60, you know, on up, you know, add, a, add another zero to that if you want to get into something that's custom made. Um, and uh, quality differs, uh, you know, quality in terms of, you um, uh, as we refer to or think about the construction of the knife. Uh, some knives have a stamped steel blade uh, where a big old machine just uh, cuts out like, like, like a cookie cutter um, the blades uh, from a sheet of metal and then it's further processed you know, with a, a cutting edge uh, added to it um, or, or machined you know, into the metal. And then uh, we can get to the the bespoke end of the spectrum where knives are handmade and, and hammered and, and uh, worked over a fire. Um, and of course those uh, take on um, a different connection, right? To uh, the, the, the history and the heritage of blacksmithery and, and um, sword making. And uh, you know, there are some excellent um, knife makers um, in many, many regions around the world. And of course, uh, you're going to pay a pretty penny for those uh, as well. But um, because knives, uh, the selection of a knife is really, uh, it, ideally, it's an individualized, you know, tailored sort of an experience. You know, 
I recommend that you try to get your hands on a few knives to try them on, so to speak, and, and see how the weight and the balance and the size of the handle uh, fit your hand. And, uh, you know, even better if you're able to actually use that knife, even for a couple of minutes to slice some carrots or onions or something else with a little bit of density, um, something maybe more than fresh herbs, uh, just to get a feel, right, for how that blade moves through that particular food product or a few different items, um, you know, relative to the, the, the thickness of the blade, you know, that I just mentioned, for example. Okay. Um, and then go from there. Uh, you know, also uh, keep in mind that uh, a chef's knife from the side profile, right? If you have the handle here, um, the, the depth of the blade should be sufficient that you don't hit your knuckles on the cutting board. Uh, that's a concern that I hear about every once in a while. And um, there are other knives, such as utility knives, that are much more shallow. Uh, in terms of the height of that blade, and they're used in a different manner. Um, and if we try to use those as we would a chef's knife, then the tendency is for the knuckles to bang into the cutting board, which is no fun. Um, so uh, do uh, be aware of that as you select a knife and uh, then move forward with practice. Um, we all progress at different rates, okay? And uh, depending on so many different variables. And so, you know, keep in mind that, uh, you know, some of you will really want to focus on the preciseness of your cuts and uh, to really make them, uh, you know, very attractive and consistent throughout. Um, whereas, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the, the, the routine of daily cooking, um, you know, we're going to get to a point where we add speed uh, to that accuracy um, that, that we had to start out with, okay? And um, so the end result is a balance between the accuracy uh, that you create and the speed at which you prepare your food. And you're going to find where that balance is for you and in that mix just how precise you want to be. OK. And then also, you know, keep in mind that you might choose to apply more time, attention uh, and um, strive for greater preciseness with your cuts, depending on the meal that you're creating. So, you know, for example, uh, if it's a, a special occasion or a special meal that I'm preparing, I might elect to uh, make my cuts a little more attractive and um, uh, so that uh, the, the visual presentation of, of that finished product is a, just a little bit sharper, a little bit crisper, a little bit more attractive to uh, my guests' eyes. And, um, you know, whereas in the course of my daily food prep, uh, speed, right, uh, is more important. And so the accuracy drops off a bit. And so that's a, a, an area that you get to play with, um, you know, as you... Uh, develop your knife skills, okay? But uh, you know, do keep in mind that uh, the the different cuts that we talk about, small dies, medium dies, or julienne, uh, et cetera, uh, those are common terms uh, in the restaurant industry, uh, especially in the U.S., but also outside of the U.S., uh, in um, places and among people that have had exposure to or some sort of training or education uh, that is uh, based in these Euro-American traditions, okay? Um, you know, I find uh, chefs, for example, and, and other cooks um, in, in Mexico and in Japan and in, in India and other places that I've uh, visited that use this same vocabulary. And so it becomes really um, helpful, right, to speak a common language uh, so that we can uh, avoid mistakes, miscommunications, you know, when we work together and otherwise just have uh, a more free conversation. Okay. And so with that in mind, I ask you also to, to be aware of that vocabulary and um, try to use it and, uh, you know, associate it with the particular cut sizes um, that uh, make up that particular 
uh, cut, all right, julienne or a small dice, for example. All right. Uh, excellent. Um, so, uh, you know, with that foundation, uh, that, that context around knife skill development, let's go ahead and jump into today's questions. And uh, the first one is from Krishna, who says, uh, uh, just want to know, how do you manage or log your inspirational dishes and ideas? Is there a method to it? Uh, pen and paper or uh, maybe something easier on screen, something that might be computer-based, I think is what Krishna is asking. And, um, you know, I do a little bit of both. Um, when I come across uh, websites or, or blogs or other information online, I'll bookmark it. And so I've got a, a list, um, you know, of some sites that I might reference once in a while. Um, and then I've also uh, kind of fall back on, on pen and paper, that, that old school method. I just, uh, I like to handle that sort of material. Um, that's part of the aesthetic uh, that I like. And so, you know, I, I do have uh, recipes and, uh, you know, usually with notes in the margins that I've made, modifications to the recipe that I've made uh, that are in a, a folder. Uh, that's accessible in the kitchen. And uh, so those that will come out once in a while, um, you know, when I want to sort of, uh, re uh, when I want some help remembering uh, some things that uh, I've done in the past. And then also I've got a bunch of books. Uh, in fact, I think every room in the house has food books. Um, most of them probably have some recipes in them. Uh, but others are food history and food culture and, and uh, food economy and, and other books on food. But, um, uh, you know, I've got a lot of um, little uh, sticky notes that I uh, have um, used to earmark recipes or photographs or, or uh, other ideas um, that I might go to every once in a while to, again, refresh my memory and stir up some inspiration. All right, so I hope that's helpful for you, Krishna. Go forth and have some fun. Uh, next up, uh, I got a question from Michael, uh, who says, good morning. Good morning to you, Michael. Uh, I find that the lesson on breakfast meals teaches recipes that are quite different from those on the back of packages. In general, how useful are the recipes on the back of a box? Um, Wow, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I gotta say, I probably haven't cooked anything off the back of a box in a while. So um, I, I need to, as I'm talking to you, try to recall what uh, that might look like. But, you know, I'm guessing overall, you know, that those recipes uh, can be a, a fine place to start. Uh, generally speaking, uh, recipes that appear uh, on boxes and, and also in, uh, let's say, advertisements for products, whether it's in print or online or some somewhere else, uh, you know, those are recipes that um, sometimes come from a chef or a, a culinarian in some context that the product company uh, worked with, right, in order to develop. Uh, that might then feature them. Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, yes, you know, as we, uh, you know, think about those recipes on the, on the back of a box, for example, I think they've been vetted, um, you know, by a chef or, or, or a culinarian that's been working with that uh, product company. So as a place to start, I think it's probably pretty good. Um, what I like to do when I, uh, when I want to, understand a recipe, whether it's on a box or in a book or somewhere else, is to make it as it's written so that I can 
understand or try to understand what the author intended. Uh, and then I'll take notes. And then the next time I'll make modifications that better suit my context here. And uh, so, you know, I hope that you might approach it in that way. Um, you know, whether it's wherever the recipe comes from, give it a try the way it's printed again to understand what the intent was uh, and then to go forth with your own modifications, make it your own to fit the, uh, the, the dietary restrictions or dietary needs or, you know, other uh, variables in your context. All right. Thank you. All right. And uh, the next question uh, is on pickles. So what are your thoughts on pickled vegetables such as jalapeno slices in vinegar? Can it be that simple? Uh, yes. I mean, we refer to this category as the quick pickle. And, um, you know, the uh, jalapenos and escabeche, right, uh, uh, in the, the vinegar. Um, sometimes it's, you might see uh, pickled red onion slices uh, that are you know, soaked in a, a vinegar, sugar, salt solution. Um, some people might dilute it with a touch of water. Uh, it's going to be optional. And, um, of course, the vinegar that you choose should be strategically done as well. Um, you know, first of all, I would encourage you to look at the, the culinary tradition from which that pickle came from. And so, you know, in the case of a, a Mexican quick pickle, like a, um, a uh, uh, sliced onion pickle, uh, very often it is apple cider vinegar that's used. Um, I also like to use rice vinegar because it's got a, a relatively mild flavor, mild uh, sort of a bite to it. And so it provides a nice balance, I feel, uh, in the end product. Um, but, uh, you know, you bet, you know, the, the idea of making a quick pickle uh, is that you can have something ready to complement your meal or your, your sandwich or, you know, whatever that pairing might be uh, pretty quickly, right? And maybe half an hour uh, or a couple of hours if you've got that much time. And these things can hang out in the fridge, you know, for a few days as well. And uh, so I encourage you to, you know, have some fun with these things. Uh, try some combinations that, um, that appeal to you. Um, all depending on what kinds of foods you make, what types of cooking methods you might use, and what sorts of global cuisine flavor profiles you enjoy. All right. Uh, give that a try. Thank you. All right. And the next question. Uh, I enrolled because I've not uh, been exposed to a lot of flavors, mostly processed foods and comfort foods. Uh, will we discuss flavors, spices, um, and combo concepts, and then can we experiment as we create, or will there be just basic flavor profiles? Um, you, know, you bet, in our full courses, uh, Forks Over Knives, or Pro Cook, or Pro Plant, for example, uh, those being our most popular full-length courses, you know, we do have lessons on fl uh, flavor development that uh, will focus on spices and, and herbs and other ingredients as well. And we have uh, a set of practice recipes that will get you in the kitchen and, you know, applying these ingredients. And uh, then the rest of it is up to you, right, to really uh, continue that uh, the, the practice and, and to deepen your understanding of these combinations of flavors. And so uh, this is where a lot of thinking uh, is helpful. And you know, really slow down and think about what it is that you're tasting. You know, the sweetness, the acidity, the bitterness, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And, and then also the flavors. Is it lemony or limey or is it raspberry or is it something else? 
um, that adds to the layers of complexity of the food that uh, you're creating. Um, you know, also um, taste these ingredients, these spices, herbs, vinegars, mustards, vegetables, fruits, whatever it happens to be, taste these on their own so that you begin to understand more precisely what it is that that ingredient lends to that dish. Um, you know, as I mentioned uh, it, it, with the last question, vinegars differ in their level of acidity, their, their sharpness of, of the, um, that soury uh, aspect. Um, and then also uh, to use vinegars as an example, again, they all have an accompanying flavor. And uh, so to understand what that combination is like on its own, I think is important to your bigger picture understanding of cooking and your success in controlling flavor development. Okay. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, the creative piece, um, as you go through, uh, you know, assignments that you submit to us, first of all, keep in mind what I just mentioned a few minutes ago, and that is make the recipe as stated so that you can understand what the author intended, uh, the recipe, practice recipes, uh, or, um, yeah, the, 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 the practice recipes that are aligned with assignments that you submit to us um, have been chosen because they support the particular learning outcomes of that lesson, a particular cooking method or some sort of a technique, you know, that uh, is integral to that lesson. Um, so my recommendation is to follow through uh, as written, understand it, uh, you know, through maybe a couple of, couple of uh, go rounds, and then you can start to make some changes to make it your own. Okay. Uh, that's always the process that I recommend and certainly the process that I follow as well. All right. I hope that's helpful for you. All right. Uh, and then the next question, uh, have you ever used an oven that can inject steam? If you have, what other foods would benefit from the steam besides bread? Uh, let's see. Yes, I have. Um, you know, both in a commercial kitchen um, it, as well as at home where uh, steam can be created by uh, inserting a pan with water. Uh, sometimes uh, people use ice, uh, but, but uh, water uh, in some form uh, then will create steam in that hot environment. And, you know, I, I got to say that... Um, um, you know, most of the, um, well, there's two categories. You know, on, on one hand, probably for, um, lately, I'll say most of it has been in bread baking. But then also there are ovens, especially in commercial kitchens, that uh, are called combi ovens, combination ovens. They go by the term combi oven. And um, they have steam settings and um the, the, the doors have a seal around the edge. And so it really holds in that moisture. And um, oftentimes meat, uh, large roasts are cooked uh, in a moist environment over, uh, at a relatively low temperature and across a relatively long period of time uh, in order to minimize moisture loss and in order to maximize yield. And then it also brings an element of control uh, to the way the product is cooked, okay? And in this particular context with this type of equipment, uh, you can adjust the setting such that um, prior to service or prior to the, the in this case, the meat being finished cooking, you can turn off the steam and crank up the heat and create a nice caramelized crust on the exterior. And uh, so this is you know, one example of, of how you know, steam is commonly used in a lot of restaurants um, you know, around the world. 
And, you know, as a, you know, for example, as a predecessor to uh, this sort of technology, uh, we have traditions where a food item, and this could be uh, not just meat, but it could be a, a vegetable item as well, is encased in salt. And then that is roasted. And the idea is that the moisture stays in, uh, the salt itself gets hot uh, during that uh, baking or roasting process. And then it also imparts some seasoning uh, during the cooking process. And so, the, you know, those um, are a couple of examples that come to mind. So, you know, to answer generally, um, you know, your um, uh, questions here, uh, you know, th this idea of, of, of creating steam or injecting steam could be used for other things, uh, you know, besides bread. Um, I, I, I'm not thinking of or recalling uh, any uh, sort of regional traditional foods immediately, but uh, if you do a search, you might come across some. Um, and keeping in mind that, uh, you know, what you might come across might be aligned with um, uh, this uh, salt encrusted roasting uh, or foods that are wrapped in large leaves um, from uh, many parts of the world, right, have had those uh, sorts of traditional food handling methods. And those are um, uh, all in an attempt to um, steam a product, okay? Um, so, uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers your questions or, or creates some context for you to further investigate, right? Thank you. All right, and the next question. Uh, I made potato wedges with garlic, sauteed mushrooms with a potato cream topping, cream made with potatoes, tofu, cashew, lemon, salt, garlic, onion powder, just not popping in flavor. Do you have recommendations to improve this? Well, not popping in flavor. I, I, you know, I guess I'd, I'd want to sit down with you, Sharice, to really understand your palate better. Um, your uh, list of ingredients sound like a wonderful place to start. You know, you might consider uh, adjusting the ratios, in, in particular on, let's say, the acid and salt components. Um, so for acidity, you mentioned... Well, you mentioned lemon. I'm I'm thinking lemon juice, although it could be lemon zest. Uh, keep in, in mind that those two function differently um, in cooking, where lemon juice provides acidity, an important seasoning, right, that goes often hand in hand with salt to bring brightness or interest to the palate. Um, I often describe it as making the food dance on your tongue. Uh, whereas the zest of citrus fruit brings in the volatile oils and the aroma. Aroma equals flavor, so it, it uh, brings in greater flavor interest uh, to the food product. Okay, so if you can use both uh, where appropriate, I encourage you to do that. Um, but in terms of this pop, you, you say pop in flavor, um, Sometimes when I hear pop, I think of salt and, and acid. Okay, in this case, uh, lemon juice and kosher salt, according to your list. Um, but flavor, try some uh, pulling the lemon zest off and uh, see how uh, how that suits your palate. I mean, otherwise, as we look at the ingredients, okay, um, potato is a heavy ingredient, tofu is a heavy ingredient, cashews are heavy. Um, garlic is heavy and onion powder is relatively heavy. And so those all have a lot of earthy qualities to them. So yes, um, uh, go for lemon juice and, and the zest as the place to start here. But, um, uh, I mean, otherwise keep in mind that it, you know, if, if your palate preference is a little bit different from other people, right, that uh, we might want to investigate some other additions or changes. Okay, but give that a try first. Thank you. All right, uh, next up from Omar. Uh, is there some way I could actually buy 3D shapes of the kind of cuts we learn? Uh, yes. Um, if you do an online search, there are companies that produce uh, 3D models of the cuts. 
And the ones that um, you know I have used in the past for my students are they're about this big, and they fit easily into a cutlery kit or you know even your your pocket. And uh, it's, it's something you can just set down in front of you, and you kind of look at that and make cuts, and then set your cuts up against those examples to compare. And you know I think um, it can be a helpful tool for some students. And I encourage you to give that a try if you think that's uh, going to be helpful for you. Um, I will also throw out a um, sort of a word of uh, uh, encouragement, and that is don't use it too much or for too long. OK, uh, use it uh, initially in order to uh, adjust your eye right, to understand what a julienne looks like versus a batonet or, or something else. Um, and then move on developing your, your hand-eye coordination and, and the new muscle movement and, and strengths that you need, um, you know, in the different parts of your body, okay, to, to further develop your skills. Um, in other words, you don't want to be six months down the road and still using this tool. Um, that's not the point of the tool. And in fact, it's, it's going to slow down your development if you uh, depend on it too much. But, um, you know, otherwise, uh, yes, you can find those tools, uh, those references, and uh, give it a try. Thank you. All right. And uh, the next question. Uh, hello, Chef. Hello, Natosha. Uh, my question is, how do you know what is the best way to keep your stainless steel knives sharp and keeping the tips from bending or breaking off? Okay. Um, so um, when it comes to knives, so, you know, as I uh, mentioned early in today's program, I encourage everyone to add at least one knife that is of pretty robust quality, okay, to your knife kit. Really, all you need is one, okay? And, uh, you, you know, if I, for a lot of people ask about um, sort of a good entry point and a good value, in my opinion, uh, is the Victorinox brand Fibrox line of cutlery. And they have chef's knives in different sizes, uh, meaning the blade length. And uh, you know, an eight-inch chef's knife is pretty common uh, for home use. Um, you know, if that feels um, uh, well, if it feels too big, two things come to mind. One is to just give it a try and try to get used to it, uh, because it really is a nice all-purpose size. Um, but if it really is uh, big and uncomfortable for you, then you can consider a smaller size, let's say a, a seven inch blade, which is quite a bit shorter and it has a very different feel to it. Um, there are shorter chef's knives, six inch, and I've seen five inch chef's knives. Um, although I generally don't recommend knife, uh, chef's knives that small. Um, it, it, they just don't cover the real estate, uh, the, the cutting board space. Um, efficiently um, during food prep. So I, I do recommend an eight inch, uh, maybe as short as a seven. Uh, a lot of folks uh, in higher volume settings will use larger chef knives. But anyway, if you look at a Victorinox Fibrox, something in the range of an eight inch chef's knife, I think they go for probably $60 or so. And uh, it provides a very nice value uh, in terms of the, the metal of the blade is soft enough that it's um, easy enough to, to sharpen and to maintain, yet it's hard enough that it will hold the cutting edge a reasonably long time, okay? Now, back to uh, your questions here, uh, Natosha, in terms of the maintenance of that knife, uh, daily maintenance uh, should include uh, the steel, Okay, that that just that rod that uh, comes with a cutlery kit. You can buy them separately, of course, um, but that is used to keep the cutting edge 
aligned. Okay, and so um, if we look at you know a, a, a blade straight on, okay, and we look at the, the the cutting edge, after we use it a few times, it starts to roll over. And when we apply it to the steel, what we're doing, uh, what we should be doing is straightening that up, okay? If it rolls over, then the knife is going to lose its sharpness and its cutting edge. And um, uh, it's going to feel dull, but we're not, we don't call it dull just yet. Um, in other words, it doesn't need to be sharpened on a stone or on a knife sharpener. It just needs to be put on the steel to be aligned again. And you should steal your knife probably once a day, you know, is adequate for most home cooks. Uh, if you're uh, producing a, a lot of volume of food, um, you know, like in a, in a restaurant kitchen, then you might steal your knife multiple times a day. Okay. And um, let me share a couple of things about using a steel. Okay. Uh, very often when we see a chef on TV, uh, as they're looking at the camera and they're holding the steel in one hand and their knife in the other, they're just sort of doing this real fast. And then they, they get down and they start cutting. Um, that's not the best way to do that, in my opinion, for most people, most of the time. Meaning that it's important that we straighten up the cutting edge. And in order to know that the cutting edge is sharp, uh, after we apply it to the steel, we need to take a few seconds and run our, our thumb or our finger across the blades or you know, perpendicular to the cutting edge in order to, and we, and we do that on, in both directions, in order to feel how even or how aligned the cutting edge is. So in other words, you can apply the knife to the steel and it can get straighter but still not be straight, okay? Or you can apply the knife to the steel and even bend it the other way. Uh, so it's important that we take a few seconds and feel, right, with our, uh, our thumb very, very often, um, running perpendicular to the blade uh, to see that uh, or to feel that the drag is even, on both sides, okay? Uh, if it's uneven, you're gonna feel more drag this way and it's gonna feel smooth in this direction. But once we straighten that up, it'll feel even from both directions. That's what we want, okay? In terms of daily maintenance of the knife when using the steel, okay? Now, after some time has passed, the blade will actually wear down. Okay, and that's when we say, yeah, this knife has gotten dull and I need to sharpen it. And you can either learn to do it yourself or you can send it out to a knife sharpener. Okay, um, and you can do it yourself using uh, an electric knife sharpener or um, if you want the challenge of learning how to use whetstones, uh, then you can acquire a set of two or three whetstones and then go through the, 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 the learning curve of, of uh, using uh, a, a set of whetstones to maintain your knives, okay? Now, a word of caution uh, regarding sending your knives out to professional knife sharpeners, okay? Um, there are a lot of different folks out there in terms of skill level, and there are certainly some really good ones out there, and there are also some folks out there that... Um, um, uh, shouldn't be in the business. And, and some of the results that I've seen, um, you know, I've seen knives that were uh, damaged. Uh, they were ground down so heavily that it indicated, it was, it was equivalent to, to probably, I'm, I'm not kidding, 50 years worth of use. Um, and, and this was because the knife was given to somebody who really didn't know how to use the sharpening equipment um, and uh, just ground it down too much. And so uh, before you choose a 
professional. Uh, check their references, you know, ask around um, and to find, you know, somebody that you uh, will be able to trust. Okay. And uh, so kind of a long answer to your quick questions here, Natosha, um, but I hope that helps. Uh, regarding the tips from bending and breaking off, um, a couple things come to mind. Uh, you know, number one, if uh, you acquire uh, or are using a, you know, what I'm calling a, a fairly robust quality knife, the tips are not going to bend, uh, at least not very easy, not in routine cutting. Okay, and they're not going to break off unless they have been dropped uh, or really banged on something. I've seen tips break. I agree with that. It does happen. Um, and it, if it does happen, you can grind them th that you can grind the blade down in order to reestablish a, a tip. Um, but, um, you know, the other thing is please do not use your knife, your chef knife, uh, to to poke at things or to pry open things or to in, in lieu of a screwdriver or, uh, you know, only use it to cut food. Um, now the exception, okay, uh, is, and this is totally up to you. Okay. I'm not suggesting you do this, but if you've got a heavy knife, um, and, and down here by the handle, this is called the heel. Um, sometimes the heel is very heavy and that is sometimes used, um, to, open up cans if you don't have a can opener or, or to break open nuts if, you know, nothing else works. And, uh, and so the heel of a knife can be used for some other things. Um, keep in mind that it's going to take a little bit of abuse and not look so pretty. Um, so if you've got a knife that you really, you know, want to, to, to maintain in pristine condition, don't use it to open up a can. Um, but, um, you know, otherwise, uh, certainly don't use the tip uh, to do anything else, you know, besides just rocking the knife back and forth as you slice. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, Richard, thank you for uh, putting up the Victorinox uh, link. And next up uh, from Mary, uh, does Ruby have any course that teaches some fancy knife skills, things like roses uh, from radishes? Uh, no, uh, we don't. Um, uh, the quick answer is no. I, you know, I think in um, our uh, Jacques Pepin course, uh, we do have a particular recipe that um, sort of looks at um, you know, making um, an apple rose that's roasted. Uh, it, it's uh, part of the, the dessert lesson. Um, but I think outside of that example, we do not have, um, you know, these um, uh, um, fancy knife cut lessons. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, do recipe developers go through special training or is it a skill mostly developed through um, experience and experimentation? Well, you know, I think... Um, uh, for the most part, uh, at least in my experience, uh, it comes with uh, one's experience and one's understanding of, of many, many different aspects of food um, that gives them the, the ability. Uh, and, and I mean that in a sincere way, okay? The understanding and that, that broad and deep ability uh, to test and develop recipes. Um, you know, is, is there special training? Uh, I think if you work with somebody, you know, in a, a apprenticeship or, you know, that sort of a, of a, of a relationships uh, context, then we might call that special training. Um, but, uh, um, and, and, you know, there might be classes out there that I'm unfamiliar with, but I think regardless of whether one takes a class or not, uh, it's really helpful to have a lot of experience with food and cooking in order to understand not just how to do something, but how not to do something. So in other words, understanding the mistakes 
and how to fix mistakes, how to recognize mistakes, and how to avoid mistakes um, is just as important as understanding how to do something correctly the first time. And uh, that is really uh, a, a big advantage of being a, a, a chef instructor, right, or a culinary educator is because, you, you know, we work with so many students and students make so many different mistakes in ways that, that I wouldn't do. Uh, and so I get, I, I've gotten to see so many different um, ways of, uh, of screwing something up that I have learned tremendously over the years from my many thousands of students. And I think that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of experience that um, can really inform the process of, of uh, recipe development. And um, um, so, you know, hopefully that, that context uh, is helpful for you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. And next up from Kim, uh, do you have a favorite vegan burger recipe? Um, no, uh, I don't have a favorite one per se. Um, you know, I will say that um, in uh, at least a couple of our courses, you know, Pro Cook and maybe even Forks Over Knives, um, you know, we've got um, lessons that uh, look at this topic area and uh, you know, we approach it pretty generally, uh, and that is understanding the structure of a patty and then understanding how to build flavor in the patty. Um, and then, you know, once you understand that framework, then you can tailor um, a, a plant-based burger, uh, you know, to whatever event is in front of you or whatever uh, sort of direction that you want to steer that into. Okay. Um, and this was a good time for me to also sort of reinforce this idea that, you know, here at Ruby, uh, a big point that sets us apart from most everybody else is that, you know, we emphasize cooking methods and food handling techniques. Uh, in other words, a very generalized approach to cooking. Generalized, okay, meaning that this creates the foundation of your knowledge and skill set that can be applied to most any cooking that you come across, okay? Um, and so uh, once you uh, study, practice, and have confidence with this uh, set of skills uh, that Ruby teaches, you're going to be able to handle any recipe uh, with, with confidence, okay? Whereas if you take the opposite approach, let's say you don't have a foundation of skills and knowledge, but instead you look at uh, a meal via the recipe lens, then you're kind of bound to that recipe. You're bound to the way that that author constructed that dish. Um, but what we strive to teach you, our student, is the understanding of the process. Uh, and so in the case of some of these things, like a burger patty, we will provide some specific examples for you to practice. Yes. Uh, but we also provide a broad framework uh, for you then to sort of create your own path with. And uh, you're going to understand that you, you know, you'll, you'll need certain things that are sticky, uh, that act as a binder to hold this whole uh, conglomeration together. And that, you know, to think about uh, flavors and, and other ingredients that will make this thing satisfying in the end. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, you know, hopefully uh, this makes sense for all of you out there. All right. And then uh, the next question from Tara. Uh, hello. Uh, it's watermelon season uh, where I live. Excellent. Uh, that's, that's where I live too. Um, what are your favorite ways of using this melon? Um, it, two ways immediately come to mind. And one is just uh, slicing those wonderful things and, and, of course, enjoying them as is. 
And uh, in fact, that was part of my breakfast this morning. I had about three slices of watermelon. And then uh, the other thing that comes to mind is juice. And uh, you know, if you've got a nice watermelon in your hands, you know, with uh, all that aroma and flavor and sweetness, then put that in the blender. And um, you know, oftentimes to chill the watermelon uh, will sort of br bring out some of those good qualities. So consider the temperature, and then also um, a, uh, a a squeeze of acidity, right, will also act as a, a seasoning to bring out some of those um, natural qualities, those characteristics. Some people like a little touch of salt as well, which is fine. Um, you know, I like a, a, a squeeze of lime juice uh, in with my watermelon juice and, and that's it. And so it, those two things are tops on my list. Uh, I mean, otherwise, you know, incorporate large cubes of watermelon in a salad and they go really well with salty components. And so it could be a, you know, salty nuts. Uh, it could be something like feta cheese, um, you know, or olives. Uh, and then uh, it brings in that, that hit of sweetness, uh, a lot of moisture. And of course, they look beautiful, uh, not just red, but those other colors of watermelon that you might stumble upon. Um, on a, on a rare occasion these days, I might grill watermelon, you know, just to add some interest to uh, the, the platter, you know, the, the, the larger offering at the table. And um, uh, so, you know, you can uh, develop some interesting complexity with the uh, caramelized sugars on the surface and also the smoky flavor that can be added to the watermelon. All right. Um, Let's see. Yeah, you know, those are a few things that come to mind. And uh, but but, you know, otherwise, I think th during this time of the year, at almost any meal period uh, to put out a plate of sliced uh, or, you know, and what you know, we'll do here is uh, cut out these. Um, um, uh, I'll say wedges, well, they're, they're wedges, I guess, but OK. Get your watermelon, cut it in half, put the cut side down, and then, uh, you know, you can uh, just cut uh, slices this way and then cut them again this way. And so you end up with these long pieces of watermelon with a little handle at the end. And just to, to put out a plate of those at every meal, uh, I think is really nice. Then to allow the diners um, to bring in a bite of sweet watermelon with its juiciness and its particular aroma with um, a salty something at the table or a more dense something or a more dry something at the table. So the watermelon acts as this beautiful balancing component um, across uh, so many different meals just on its own. All right. I hope you'll give that a try. Uh, and then last up is uh, a question from Monique. Uh, hello. Uh, is it possible to write down somewhere the information about the knives? Or can I see this um, Q&A again? Because I'm on holidays and sitting right now in the grass somewhere next to cows. <laughs> that sounds like an awesome place to be. Um, yes, uh, this live event uh, will be archived. So just look at it under today's date and under my name. And then, you know, you can, uh, uh, you know, listen to uh, uh, the, the, the discussion on, on knives. Um, and uh, I mean, otherwise, if you want to reach out to me uh, directly at support at ruby.com and then pose your question and then I can respond to you directly. Okay. And uh, I'll be here. So whenever, uh, you know, you get back in from the pasture, uh, I'll be waiting for you. All right. And until next time, uh, happy cooking to all of you. Thank you.